More champagne, Mom? Larry asked, refilling my glass before I could even answer. I gave a hesitant smile, nervously glancing at my son and his fiancée. We were having a small family dinner to celebrate their engagement, but something didn't feel right in my stomach. To your happiness, Laura, I said, raising my glass. Laura clinked her glass against mine with a purr. I took a big sip. There's something we want to talk about tonight, Larry said, sharing a knowing look with Laura. We're planning a big engagement party next month. Only the best for us. I laughed a bit nervously. That sounds wonderful for you both. But aren't those parties expensive? Oh, we're not paying for it, Laura said casually, waving her hand. That's going to be your gift to us. I almost choked on my drink. I'm sorry? As Larry's mother, it's your duty to pay, Laura continued. We expect you to chip in at least $30,000. Consider it an investment in your son's future. They couldn't be serious. $30,000 for a party. I asked, shocked. Do you realize how unreasonable that is? Don't be ridiculous, Mom, Larry cut in. You make good money, and you have all that inheritance from Dad. You've been saving it all. The mention of my husband, who had recently died from cancer, felt like a fresh wound. I pulled back, hurt by their harsh words. That money is my savings for retirement and to cover my expenses. You didn't even discuss this with me first. Laura rolled her eyes dramatically. Still on about being consulted? Get over it already. You're the mother of the groom. This is what's expected. Just pay up and be happy we're even letting you help. You should feel honored we're inviting you, Larry sneered. Just write the check so we can start planning. I sat there stunned, unable to believe their arrogance and lack of care. I tried once more to reason with my son. Honey, be reasonable. You can have a nice party without it costing so much. Maybe we can cut back a little? Larry slammed his fist on the table, making the glasses shake. I knew you'd be stingy, he yelled. Some mother you are, not even supporting your only son. Tears filled my eyes as I faced their scornful looks. I had always pampered Larry, but I never thought he could be so cruel and disrespectful. I stood up quickly, feeling disgusted by the two unpleasant people in my home. I think you should leave now, I said in a low voice. Laura jumped up and grabbed my shoulders with her sharp red nails. Don't even think about shirking your responsibilities, she hissed, her breath heavy with perfume assaulting my nose. Pay up, or you can forget about having a relationship with Larry and seeing any future grandchildren. I pushed her off forcefully. Get out, I yelled. Leave my house this instant. They left without another word, but I caught them smirking triumphantly at each other. My heart sank as I realized the engagement celebration. I had hoped for would only bring greed, manipulation, and pain. The next evening, tired from a long day at work, but determined to resolve the conflict, I prepared a simple pasta dinner, hoping for a frank discussion with Larry. I heard the front door slam and braced myself as loud footsteps approached. Something smells good, Larry said as he walked into the kitchen and headed straight for the wine cabinet. My hopes lifted briefly then faded as Laura followed him in, reeking of strong perfume so much for a private chat. To what do I owe the pleasure? I asked, trying to sound calm as I drained the pasta. You're going to love what we have planned, Laura said cheerfully, ignoring my tone as she dug through her flashy handbag. We met with the wedding planner today, and everything is set. All we need is one little thing from you. She pulled out a folder stuffed with brochures and invoices. Just sign here for the $70,000 wedding package. I froze, a chill running down my spine. $70,000, I exclaimed. For a one-day event? That's absurd. It's our special day, Larry complained. Don't I deserve the best? I tried to appeal to his better nature. Son, be reasonable. Let's have a small, meaningful ceremony instead of this extravagance. Laura slammed the folder down. You clueless fool, who said you have a say in this? She screamed. You will pay every penny to give your only son the wedding of his dreams. Anger surged within me, 
But before I could respond, we all turned in surprise to see my daughter Linda standing in the doorway, looking determined. I was so caught up in the argument that I didn't even notice her come in. Stay out of this, Laura snapped at my daughter, Linda, who is a bold, tattooed graphic novelist. This doesn't concern you. The hell it doesn't, Linda shot back. You don't talk to my mother like that. She walked over and stood next to me protectively. Normally, I might have been a bit upset by her stepping in. I've always tried to be the strong, independent head of our family. But right then, I was grateful for her support. Larry threw his hands up dramatically. I ask for one simple wedding, and my whole family turns against me. He pointed at Linda. This is all your fault. You're filling mom's head with crazy ideas. She owes me this money and her loyalty. Linda crossed her arms. Mom owes you nothing but basic respect, which you clearly can't give back, she said. She raised you all by herself after dad died, working hard to give you every chance in life. And this is how you thank her? By using her? Larry had no comeback, just mumbled under his breath. Linda turned to me, holding my hand firmly. Stay strong, mom. Set your limits and demand the respect you deserve. I'm here for you. Feeling a surge of relief, my doubts washed away by my daughter's firm support, I stood up taller. You both have two choices, I said loudly to Larry and Laura. Treat me and my daughter with basic decency, or leave our lives for good. Laura opened her mouth, probably ready to say something harsh, but then she saw Linda's stern look and thought better of it. She grabbed Larry by the ear and dragged him out. I squeezed Linda's hand, tears of gratitude in my eyes. How did I get so lucky to have a daughter like you? She gave a wry smile, just being a chip off the old block. Now, let's eat that pasta and plan our next move. These jerks don't know who they're dealing with. The next week was tough, filled with uncertainty. My phone buzzed nonstop with demanding texts and voicemails from Larry, angry when I didn't call back right away. I started ignoring his calls, not having the energy to deal with his rants. When Saturday afternoon arrived, I decided to treat myself to a manicure to cheer myself up. As I relaxed and the technician worked on my nails, my phone buzzed again. Normally, I would ignore it, but this time, I saw it was Larry's number and curiosity got the better of me. Hi, honey, I answered cautiously. It's your witch of a mother came Laura's harsh voice instead, making my blood start to boil. I was about to hang up when I heard Larry in the background. Is the old bag actually taking your call? She's been dodging mine all week. Then Larry's voice came through clearly. Mom, what the heck? I've been calling nonstop. Have you thought more about funding the wedding? The coordinator is on my case. I was ready to say no firmly, but Laura cut me off. Oh, forget it already. She's clearly a lost cause. I heard a slap, like she swatted his arm. Your mother is a selfish old prune. Once we're married, we'll change all the account passwords so she can't touch our money. My eyes widened. Our money? More noise followed. Then Laura sneered. Why are we even inviting her to the wedding? She'll just show up in some cheap outfit from a discount store. Their loud laughter made my blood boil but Larry's next words were worse. Right, and she'll complain about helping us, as if that tiny insurance payout compares to what I make in a month. I was furious, that tiny payout was nearly half a million dollars I had saved for retirement, not wasted like my irresponsible son. Laura laughed loudly. Oh please, we both know it was your dad's money that got you that job. Your mom couldn't handle money without a man's help. Absolutely, Larry laughed. And we're using that inheritance money way better, like our first-class trips to Australia. Their laughter enraged me. I pressed the red button on my phone so hard, I almost cracked the screen. Hearing their cruel words confirmed my suspicions and shook me deeply. My hands shook with anger and outrage. I quickly waved off the concerned looks from the nail technician, threw some cash on the counter, and rushed out the door. I drove home as fast as I could, filled with the need to talk to someone about what happened. Thankfully, Linda was already there, 
her motorcycle parked unevenly on the driveway. I burst through the front door, and Linda jumped up from the couch, surprised by my upset look. I poured out the whole story, feeling enraged. Linda's green eyes flashed with anger. Those deceivers, she shouted. I knew it. They never cared about family or celebration. They just see you as a money source. I feel so betrayed and used, I said, feeling bitter and trying not to cry. My own son, how could he? Linda took me by the shoulders, looking me in the eye. Mom, listen. We need to get proof and expose these lowlifes for who they are. She slapped her hand with her fist, showing she meant business. Contact the wedding planner. Get all the documents showing plans made without your oak. I'll look into Laura's background too. I bet her family is rich despite her act. I felt hope and courage rise in me again. Linda was right. It was time to take control and fight back. I hugged her tightly, more thankful than ever for her honesty and strength. Let's expose them, I said. Over the next four weeks, Linda and I collected a lot of evidence showing Larry and Laura's dishonesty. Linda found out that Laura came from a very wealthy family, her dad owns a big real estate investment company, and could easily pay for their extravagant wedding. Meanwhile, I got financial records from the wedding planner, showing the huge costs Larry and Laura wanted me to cover $95,000 and counting. We have everything we need to confront these cheaters, Linda announced, spreading the papers on the dining table. Let's invite them over to talk about wedding plans, and then reveal what we know, she suggested, her eyes shining with determination. I called them, pretending I was ready to discuss paying for the wedding. They took the bait and agreed to come right away. They arrived on time, the doorbell ringing loudly. Larry and Laura walked in, as usual, full of arrogance and the smell of expensive perfume. Where's my check? Larry demanded immediately, never one for subtlety. Laura elbowed him, then put on a fake sweet smile. Yes, do tell us the good news, she said cheerily. We have so many decisions to finalize for our big day. I gestured for them to sit down. Linda quietly handed me a thick manila envelope full of damning evidence. My heart raced, but I felt determined. I clasped my hands tightly on the table. Before we discuss any more plans, I have some concerns, I said. I pulled the papers from the envelope and spread them out in front of me. According to the wedding planner, the current expenses total $95,000. Can you explain this? I asked. Laura scoffed loudly. It's the wedding of the century. What do you expect? I expect honest communication about money and shared responsibility, I replied calmly. For example, why don't Laura's very wealthy parents contribute their fair share? I showed them a copy of her dad's business profile, showing he was worth tens of millions. They could easily afford it. Laura turned pale and Larry got angry. Leave Laura's family out of this. It's my wedding, my financial support, he said, pointing at me. And you're my mother, so just write the check. Expecting their denial, I calmly slid over a pile of invoices and contracts. Actually, these documents show otherwise. They have my forged signature authorizing $230,000 in non-refundable payments so far. Care to explain that? Laura gasped. Are you accusing us of fraud? From beside me, Linda slammed her fist down. Dame right she is, she shouted, surprising them into silence. She then spread out the rest of the contents from the envelope bank statements, screenshots, phone records. Clear evidence of their lies and manipulation lay scattered dramatically across the table. It's all here, clear as day, Linda said with disgust. You've been exploiting my mother's love and trust, never caring about family, just what you can get from her. You were spying on us, Larry said in outrage. Collecting evidence against your fraud, I corrected calmly. And now, you'll cancel this sham wedding immediately. Laura jumped up furious. How dare you, she yelled. I will marry Larry with or without your money. She turned to my son, expecting support. But Larry just sat there, 
pale and quiet, overwhelmed by the revelations. Finally, Laura rolled her eyes. Your spineless mama's boy, she muttered, grabbed her flashy handbag and stormed out. At the doorway, she turned to give one last angry look. You'll regret this, she hissed. We won't forget. Then she left in a huff, the smell of her perfume lingering in the air. I looked straight at my shaken son. Nor will we, I said quietly. Now leave. He got up quickly, but before he left, he mumbled a soft yet clear threat, I'll make you pay for this. The day I had dreaded finally arrived Larry and Laura's lavish wedding. Despite our previous confrontation, they went ahead with their extravagant plans, using even more of the retirement money I had put in Larry's accounts. So there I sat, a reluctant participant in their over-the-top wedding. All around me, guests who had drunk too much wandered under extravagant floral decorations that cost more than my first car. The highlight was an eight-tiered cake decorated with handcrafted sugar flowers. Larry and Laura's smug faces were displayed above everything in a huge golden frame. Next to me, Linda slouched in her ripped jeans and combat boots, her pixie-cut green hair standing out against the pastel bridesmaid dresses. We watched the lavish event unfold, barely hiding our disgust. Then, the music changed to a grand wedding march, and the crowd quieted as Larry took his place under a brightly decorated arch. My heart tightened, he looked so much like his father, handsome in his tuxedo, radiating charm. There was no sign of the greedy boy I had confronted weeks ago. As Laura walked down the aisle in a fancy dress that I suspected was charged to my credit card, old memories and sadness surged within me. Over 28 years ago, I had walked that same path, full of naive dreams of love and family that quickly turned sour. My faith in love had faded with my husband's death, and now, the son we had raised showed me the same cold disregard. As the ceremony went on, anger built inside me. I could not, would not stay silent or support this loveless marriage any longer. I stood up abruptly, my chair scraping loudly across the polished floor. Everyone looked at me. Linda took my hand, giving me strength. Clearing my throat, I met Larry's shocked look. I apologize, but I cannot stay silent about this farce, I declared. The guests murmured in shock. Larry's face turned red, and he looked embarrassed under my stern gaze. Before he could say anything, Laura pushed past him, her eyes full of anger. How dare you ruin my perfect day, she shouted, coming toward me with her hands raised aggressively. I stepped back, recoiling from Laura's hostile energy. Linda immediately stepped in front of the bride. Back off, she said firmly, standing protectively in front of me. A surprised murmur spread through the room. No one else moved to help. Larry kept his head down, not looking at me and didn't try to stop Laura. My heart broke. All illusions were gone, I no longer had a son. The greedy, cowardly stranger in front of me would never again receive my support or resources. I moved past Linda to speak to everyone. Let all bear witness to this fake, pretentious wedding, I said loudly. I refuse to support these deceivers any longer and I cut all ties. This farce ends now. I turned and walked briskly to the exit, my skirt swirling dramatically. As I passed my shocked son, I paused long enough to echo his earlier threat, you'll regret this. Then I walked away confidently, Linda right beside me, our footsteps echoing a firm departure from that toxic place. We stepped into the dim sunlight outside, the doors closing behind us, cutting off Laura's angry shouts. I took a deep, freeing breath. Relief washed over me as Linda and I got into her car. Thank you for being there with me, I told her, patting her tattooed hand. She smiled slightly. Are you kidding? I've wanted to stand up to Laura for years. As we drove away from the extravagant deceit, tears came to my eyes, but this time they were tears of relief, not sadness or regret. Looking at my brave, loyal daughter smiling back at me, I knew I would never be alone again. In the months after that disastrous wedding, I changed my phone number, moved to a new place, and shifted my remaining assets, 
cutting off all contact with Larry and his toxic bride. I heard through rumors that they had their honeymoon in Australia, likely using what was left of my retirement savings. Let them indulge, I thought bitterly, reality will catch up soon. Sure enough, just a year later, Larry showed up at my doorstep. I came home to find him sitting there, unshaven and smelling of stale cigarettes. I was so surprised that I froze, my grocery bag slipping from my hands. Larry's eyes showed a flash of embarrassment. He tried to help me pick up my things, then said quietly, Hey Ma, can we talk? I walked past him, without a word to unlock my front door, motioning for him to come inside. He lingered awkwardly as I slowly put away the groceries, stealing myself before finally speaking. What do you want? I asked bluntly. Larry cleared his throat. I, uh, need your help. Just temporarily, he quickly added, as if that made his request any less bold. I'm between jobs right now, and Laura is upset because I can't cover her expenses. Absolutely not, I said sharply, cutting off his rambling. I crossed my arms, feeling both anger and satisfaction. You made this mess, now deal with it. Larry looked shocked, not used to such a direct denial. Come on, ma, I'm really struggling here. Can't you lend me a few thousand? I'll pay you back, I swear. I stood firm, unmoving. You never planned to pay me back the first time you emptied my accounts. I reminded him coldly. Why should I believe you now? He blushed. I was wrong before, okay, but I'm still your son. With a swift motion of my hand, I cut him off. You lost that privilege long ago. I have no son, I declared, pointing at him. Now you face the consequences. Get out. He tried to speak but no words came out against my firm disgust. With drooping shoulders, Larry left my house and my life once again. It was about time he experienced the reality of his actions. I locked the door quickly, feeling a rush of vindication before any pity or regret could set in. There was no forgiving someone who repeatedly betrayed me. Larry's pitiful state was proof that karma was catching up with him. I later heard that his fancy tech startup had failed within a year, and my business contacts had shunned him. No investor wanted anything to do with his dubious schemes. Meanwhile, Laura returned to her wealthy father after too many arguments over unpaid bills. The last I heard, she was planning to divorce Larry and was involved with a wealthy older man in San Remo. That night, Linda and I toasted to their misfortunes over cocktails laughing about the rumors that Larry was now working in fast food under a fake name. Karma's a harsh one, Linda said, raising her glass. Here's to it continuing to bite those who deserve it. I happily clanked my glass against Linda's. No truer words have been spoken, I agreed. Over the next year and a half, Linda's career took off. More and more high-profile clients wanted her unique tattoo designs and graphic novels. She even got a book deal for her bold memoir about our family struggles, which was creating a buzz before it even hit the shelves. Behind the scenes, Linda trusted me with her growing finances. At her request, I used my years of experience to secure trademarks, negotiate publishing rights, and maximize her profits. I was so proud to see her passions thrive with my help. Linda started appearing in trendy fashion magazines and was featured in popular graphic anthologies. She bought a stylish loft downtown, which served as her business hub and showcased the impressive views she had earned with her talent. To celebrate Linda's success, I planned a small party at her chic new place. It would mark her as a true artistic force and independent businesswoman. Linda welcomed the guests with a bit of nervousness, so I reassured her as I adjusted her blazer. Just be yourself, everyone here already loves you. Soon, the loft was filled with Linda's creative friends, including daring writers, top publishers, edgy photographers, and even some famous faces from her celebrity clients, all there to celebrate their favorite artist. My heart swelled with pride hearing such influential people praise my daughter. This was the kind of launch party Larry could only dream of. Three years ago, 
Our family name was damaged by selfish actions, but now, thanks to Linda's hard work, we had gained respect and admiration at the highest levels of the art world. Late in the evening, I joined Linda on the balcony, looking out over the city lights. She squeezed my hand. None of this would have been possible without you, Mom. You believed in me when no one else did, and fought for me. I'll always owe you. I hugged her, holding my champagne flute. Nonsense, my brave girl. Your success is all because of your talent and vision. I just handled the business side so you could focus on creating. Linda smiled. Well, I definitely got your business sense and dad's creative flair, she joked, clinking her glass with mine. Here's to us, beating the odds and staying strong together. I laughed happily, feeling a deep joy as a mother. My daughter and I had survived tough times of greed and betrayal, and now we were thriving on our own success. As the party went on, I quietly raised my glass to the sky, thinking of her late father. We had indeed created a wonderful legacy, one built on integrity, courage, and hard work, not entitlement or manipulation. This legacy stood as a shining example to others, making the likes of Larry envious for years to come. Over the next three years, Linda's career continued to rise brilliantly. Meanwhile, I heard through the grapevine that Larry was struggling with obscurity and growing debt. His extravagant lifestyle hung on until his credit ran out and everything fell apart. Occasionally, I'd hear about Larry in the gossip columns, from Laura's very public affair to him getting fired from a car dealership for missing payments. I took these stories with quiet satisfaction, confident that our paths would never cross again. I have retired from my corporate role to focus on my passions pursuing artistic hobbies, helping disadvantaged youth, and planning trips around the world. I also decided to move to a more manageable home and found the perfect place in a scenic coastal senior community. Surrounded by mature trees and vibrant gardens, I enjoyed peaceful walks with close friends, finding a new sense of tranquility. Meanwhile, Linda found her match in Riley, a brilliant software developer who loved her spirited nature. I saw true partnership potential in him right away, and my feelings were confirmed when they moved in together. Soon after, Linda excitedly showed me the unique ring Riley had designed, announcing their engagement. My darling girl, I said, my eyes tearing up with joy, I'm thrilled you found someone who deserves your big heart. Linda described her dream of a small garden wedding, much like my own vision from decades ago, no extravagant displays, just a deep, lifelong commitment surrounded by loved ones. I held her hand, emotionally moved by how beautifully she was realizing the dreams her father and I once had. Later, as we planned the wedding over tea and biscuits, Linda hesitated then mentioned a difficult topic. Mom, about inviting Larry, I quickly waved off the idea. Let's not ruin your special day by bringing him into it, I said firmly. Linda looked conflicted. I just can't help but feel sorry for him, you know. He's clearly a mess, but he's still family even if he doesn't deserve it. I wonder if including him would be the right thing, Linda said, trailing off, unsure. Seeing my daughter's compassion, even for someone who hadn't shown her the same, I patted her hand reassuringly. You shouldn't have to compromise your kindness. If it eases your mind to show Larry some small mercy, I can handle his presence just this once. Linda exhaled in relief and squeezed my hand, thankful. You're the best, Mom, I knew you'd understand. Our sentimental moment was suddenly interrupted by my ringing cell phone. I was surprised to see Larry's name flash across the screen. It had been months since his last call, a desperate plea for money. With a grim face, I silenced the call. Speak of the devil, I remarked. Linda shook her head. He never stops trying to come back in. But don't worry, Mom. After the wedding, you'll never have to deal with his mess again. I smiled at Linda's protective words. She was right. It was time to stop listening to Larry's self-pitying attempts. I now had everything I needed right here, in a peaceful life surrounded by people who nurtured my spirit. 
No remnants from a toxic past could change that. I patted Linda's hand firmly. Onwards and upwards, my dear. Now, tell me more about those lovely flower arrangements you've been thinking about. Seats aren't available for non-family, so you'll have to stand. When I went to a restaurant to celebrate my grandson Eric's milestone, I found there wasn't a seat for me in the designated room. As I exchanged glances with the relatives who arrived at the same time, Olivia, the wife of my eldest son Jacob, threw a shocking statement at me. I felt a rush of anger, but a tap on the shoulder from my brother Patrick calmed me down. I said, I guess we should head home then, and to my surprise, everyone immediately responded with yes to my question. We made a U-turn on the spot. Despite hearing shouts and the loud noise of breaking dishes behind us, I ignored them and headed home, where I immediately took a certain action. My name is Kelly. I'm a 51-year-old office worker for a company that runs multiple restaurants. Although I'm officially listed as a store advisor, I mostly work from home. This is partly because I was born with a handicap in one leg. I don't use a wheelchair, but I can't walk without a cane, making me hesitant to go to crowded downtown areas or use public transportation. Embarrassingly, I don't visit the restaurants my company operates very often. Of course, I know this isn't good, but since losing my husband Jack suddenly to illness three years ago, my life has felt empty. Now I live alone in a smaller condo arranged for me by my brother Patrick. I gave the condo where I lived with Jack to my married son and his wife about two years ago. Some people ask if I'm lonely, but when weighing the freedom of being alone against the loneliness, the appeal of living freely wins out. Part of this is because my relationship with my son's wife Olivia is terrible. Olivia is 10 years younger than my son Jacob, currently 25. She is stylish, beautiful, and was popular as a college student model while attending a prestigious university. I've heard she appeared on TV several times. She was expected to become a news reporter with the title of Miss University, but she got pregnant with Jacob's child during the summer of her junior year, and they had a shotgun wedding. At first, she took a leave of absence from college with plans to return after giving birth, but she suffered from severe morning sickness and her health got worse. Olivia worried that her beauty would be ruined and threw a tantrum, saying, I don't want to be seen in public looking like this, and dropped out of college. At the same time, she became irritable over her uncontrollable physical condition and started behaving hysterically towards my son Jacob. Mom, please, no matter what I do, thinking it's for the best, Olivia just screams and rejects everything. The house is a mess, and it's bad for the baby's prenatal environment. I need your help, begged Jacob. So my husband and I decided to live with our son and his wife in the large condominium we had bought, intending to live there until we died. However, Living together turned out to be challenging as Olivia treated me like a servant with her haughty attitude. Don't dawdle, bring me my smoothie and crackers to bed quickly. Haven't I told you numerous times how sick I feel if I wake up with an empty stomach because of my morning sickness? She would yell. And when she wasn't yelling about that, she'd scream. Why are you washing my clothes with your old hag's clothes? No matter how expensive the fabric softener is, it won't keep the old hag smell from transferring to my clothes. Seeing enough, Jack would scold her firmly. Is it's common sense in this house to harass a pregnant woman? But she would just snap back. Even when Jack suggested that Jacob talk to her, Jacob would say, it's impossible. Nothing makes sense to Olivia right now. I wish you could just deal with it, mom, laughing it off. As infuriating as it was, the fact that Olivia was pregnant made it so we had no choice but to endure her behavior. Had Jack been his usual self, perhaps he could have taken a firmer stand against Olivia and Jacob. But looking back, Jack's body was probably already being slowly ravaged by disease at that time. Olivia had cluttered Jack's study and living room, which should have been his places of relaxation after hard work with her beauty devices, leaving no space to rest. Even trying to soak in the large bathtub 
we had ordered to relieve his fatigue was impossible. Taking a bath with that old bugger gives me the chills. Just use the shower stall instead, she would say. I faced such verbal abuse, yet Jack would say, arguing with those two just tires me out more, deciding it was best to endure it himself. Seeing Jack's attitude, Olivia and Jacob, instead of reflecting, escalated their tyrannical behavior even further. As I busily managed the household chores, dragging my ailing leg around, they paid no mind. I never want to end up like that disgraceful old hag, no matter how old I get, she said, insulting me to the visiting beautician while pointing at me. The beautician was at a loss for words at the sheer nastiness of their comments, but Olivia didn't care. We really wanted to hire a younger servant, but you know how hard it is to find someone reliable these days, right? So we settled, she declared. Even as these words were spoken, I continued my chores in silence, my leg aching and my heart full of anger towards Olivia and Jacob. As these days went on, Olivia's due date arrived, and she gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Holding his first grandson, named Eric, Jack teared up a bit when the tiny hand tightly grasped his finger. Seeing this, I nearly cried myself. The innocent smile of the baby made me want to wash away all resentments and negative feelings. But that thought was short-lived when suddenly I received news that Jack had collapsed at work. Panicked, I rushed to the hospital while trying to contact Jacob on his mobile phone, but it remained unread with no return call. Reluctantly, I asked the company to contact him on his work-issued mobile phone, but that too was in vain with no response. Hoping at least to let Jack see his grandson Eric, I contacted Olivia's mobile phone. I asked her to bring Eric to the hospital. I'm in the middle of a hair treatment at the salon, so it's impossible, she laughed and refused. Then I'll come to the salon to pick up Eric myself. Do you really think I'd entrust a baby to an old hag who can barely walk with a cane? With that, she hung up the phone. Still, I didn't give up and kept calling Olivia and Jacob's mobile phones. But in the midst of this, the operating room light went off. Then the doctor came out and informed me that Jack had just passed away. My memories of the time that followed are a complete blank. All I can recall is a hazy scene, as if viewed through frosted glass. After the funeral, which took place amid this haze, I came down with the flu. Olivia, the baby might catch it, which would be terrible. She exclaimed dramatically and told me to leave the house immediately. Already emotionally damaged by Jack's sudden death and physically weakened by fever and cough, I had no energy left to argue with hysterical Olivia. Barely managing to get dressed, I left the room but collapsed in the elevator hall entrance. Thankfully, the concierge called an ambulance and I was rushed to the hospital. According to the doctors, I was on the verge of pneumonia. Later, my brother, his wife, and my nephew no heard about my condition and took care of everything. There's no need to visit the hospital. She's been admitted, she's safe, and it would be terrible if the baby caught something, Jacob and Olivia said, not even bothering to visit. Outraged by their attitude, my nephew and his wife suggested I stay with them for a while instead of returning to the condo, where I'd just be exploited by Olivia again. Returning to the condo would mean resuming a servant-like existence before even regaining my strength. However, staying at my brother Patrick's house, where my sister-in-law's parents lived, was not an option due to infection prevention concerns. My nephew's offer was a welcome one. Deciding to accept their kind offer, I planned to first return to the condo to retrieve Jack's photos and personal items left behind. My nephew knows wife, Helen, who was worried about the situation, decided to come with me. When we visited the condominium for the first time in about a month, we found it in a terrible state. What is this mess? Dirty glasses and dishes were piled up, and the garbage disposal was clogged. The living room was no different, with delivery food containers scattered everywhere. The bathrooms and bath were in a dire state as well. I wondered how they could raise a baby in such filth. As Helen and I stood there in disbelief, Olivia, 
apparently already drunk though it was just past 3 o'clock p.m., returned with a couple of friends. Noticing us standing in the living room turned into a garbage house. Olivia looked surprised for a moment, but then quickly put on her usual smirking face and said, so you're finally back. Then get to cleaning this room right away. It got all messy because the old hag slacked off. Helen was furious at this brazen attitude. She quickly approached Olivia and said, How dare you speak to Jacob's mom like that after all she has done for you? And you just kicked her out the moment she got the flu. But Olivia and her friends just laughed it off. Birds of a feather flock together. Friends of unreasonable people are unsurprisingly unreasonable themselves, they said. Then, as if they had a great idea, they added, Why don't you just leave for good? This place is going to be Jacob's through inheritance anyway. The old hag can just go back to her parents' house. As Helen grew even angrier, I somehow remained calm. Considering their outrageous behavior so far, it was only a matter of time before Olivia and the others would try to drive me out. There was no reason for me to stay any longer with such unpleasant people, so I called Noah to ask for help, and we managed to move out all my personal belongings that had sentimental value that day. Still, when I looked back at the condominium for the last time, the memory of deciding this house would be where I'd die and Jack's smiling face when we made that decision brushed my heart. I'm sure Jack would understand this decision, I felt certain. After that, I moved into a condominium near my parents' home that Patrick had arranged for me and returned to my job, which had been on hold since before Jack passed away. I also adopted a rescue cat, which I couldn't have before due to Jack's allergy, and started living with it. Though Jacob and I work at the same company and see each other when I go to the office, we hardly ever talk. However, one day I received an unusual message from Jacob. Curious about the sudden contact, I read the message. It was about planning a milestone celebration for Eric at a restaurant this coming weekend. It seems Olivia has invited a large number of guests, including her parents, relatives, and friends. The balance will be off if no one from our side of the family attends, he said, wanting to invite me and the relatives. Why don't you ask Jack's side of the family then? I suggested but it seems they had already refused. Indeed, Jack's relatives live quite far away, and it's not a distance easily traveled back and forth. Moreover, today is already Friday, and there's hardly any time to prepare to leave the house. It's understandable that they refused. I was about to refuse again when Jacob, sensing my hesitation, said, I'm sorry for everything that's happened. For Eric's sake, could you consider our request? Though I was indeed angry with Jacob and Olivia, Eric himself is innocent. Remembering how happy Jack was about Eric's birth, I considered it. I didn't want to spoil the celebration. After hanging up and giving it some thought, I decided to attend and sent Jacob a message to let him know. On the day of the celebration, my brother and his wife, my nephew and his wife, my uncle and aunt, their children, and other relatives gathered in front of the restaurant. Helen said, I'm here today, not for that couple, but for Kelly. While calming her down, we were led to the room, the largest in the restaurant, with low tables and chairs. This setup would be difficult for me with my mobility issues, so I asked the staff for a chair that was a bit taller. However, Olivia interrupted, there's no extra seat, so just stand she said loudly with her arms crossed. Seeing Olivia's smirking face, I felt more dumbfounded than angry, wondering how she could be so mean even now. Then, impulsively, I called out to my relatives, shall we go back home then? Without hesitation, they all responded, yes. The guests on Olivia's side became unsettled by this. Olivia's parents came forward, apologizing to me and my brother and his wife, while hurriedly scolding Olivia. But Olivia, scolded in front of her relatives and acquaintances, became angry and started throwing anything she could get her hands on, like vases, framed pictures and dishes. Screams, shouts, and the sound of things breaking filled the room, 
but we left without paying any further attention. Once the relatives and I had left the restaurant, Patrick and I decided to hold a strategy meeting in preparation for what was to come. The company where I, the late Jack, and Jacob worked was originally built by my grandfather. It's a family-owned business where our relatives own more than half of all shares, with my real brother Patrick currently serving as the CEO. Jack was Patrick's close friend since college and joined the company at Patrick's request after graduating. He married a woman who was a clerk there and had a son, Jacob. But after a long illness, his wife passed away when Jacob was in the eighth grade. Patrick, seeing Jack juggling work and home life alone, suggested I marry him, probably concerned about my future due to my disability and lack of social connections. Initially hesitant, I was swayed by Jack's words, I'm a single father with a child, but I intend to take good care of you. Would you become part of our family? Jacob, who became my stepson, neither showed hostility nor warmth towards me, his new stepmother. Believing it was unreasonable to expect more from Jacob, so soon after losing his mom, I resolved to do my best as a stepmother when Jacob was about to graduate from college. I want to work at the same company as dad and mom, Jacob said, which moved me to tears. However, this peaceful period ended when Jacob had a shotgun wedding with Olivia. After living with Olivia for a while, I couldn't ignore her domineering behavior and decided to have Jacob firmly speak to his wife. I waited for Jacob in the company's underground parking lot, but instead of seeing him alone, I saw Jacob with his arm around a married colleague. Unaware, I was standing just a pillar away. They were getting intimately close. The shock was enough, but then Jacob told the woman, what if someone sees us here? We'd both get fired. She confidently replied, I won't make such a mistake, and even if my affair gets exposed, the company can't fire me. After all, I'm the president's step-nephew. Unaware of my shocked state, Jacob continued, my real mom was just a country girl, but my stepmother, even if just in name, is the company's executive vice president and the granddaughter of the founder. So she owns a significant share of the stocks and assets. When she passes, all of that will be mine. Then he drove off with the woman. Overwhelmed by what I had just heard, I returned home, unable to tell Jack. Replaying Jacob's words in my head, I gradually understood why Olivia always spoke so disdainfully of me and why Jacob never reprimanded her. It was as if peeling back layers to reveal the truth. Olivia likely received a similar explanation from the beginning of their marriage. I'm just a stepmother after all, and they believe I'm merely a tool they can treat however, they please until they inherit the estate. Both Jacob and the grandchild yet to be born feel they are entitled to everything. But there's a truth neither Olivia nor Jacob understands. In reality, Jacob and I haven't gone through an adoption process. Legally, Jacob is nothing more than Jack's stepchild with no right to inherit my estate. Needless to say, for Patrick, being the CEO, Jacob is nothing more than a stepnephew, if even that. Recovering from the shock, I immediately consulted with Patrick, Noah, and Helen. Following their advice, I took steps at the city hall to ensure no unauthorized adoption could take place. Additionally, in case of any eventuality, I arranged to entrust the management of my personal assets to a lawyer, a process that was nearly completed when Jack passed away. Jack's own estate, having been mostly spent on his first wife's illness, consisted of little more than savings and life insurance. I quickly renounced my inheritance. The reason the condominium wasn't discussed during the inheritance talks is because it was never part of the estate to begin with. It's frightening how greed can blind people. Jacob and Olivia, thinking the condominium was Jack's, probably rushed to kick me out after I renounced the inheritance. I backed down quietly, not just because I wasn't in the best of health, but also because I pitied young Eric and didn't want to disrupt his living situation drastically. But this time, I've reached my limit. I originally intended to file for an eviction due to illegal occupancy of the condominium during the milestone celebration, 
so I promptly began the process with my lawyer. Olivia's parents dragged her to the company to apologize. We were told by Olivia that we shouldn't visit because she needed to get along with the family of the person she married. That the birth and everything would be managed by Jacob's family, since an heir is being born, and we took her word for it. We had no idea things had come to this. We're truly sorry. No sooner had they been let into the living room than they apologized over and over, but it was too late for regrets. Hearing the commotion, Jacob also came running. I had no idea my wife could be this unreasonable. I truly am sorry for what I've done to mom, he said. But when Olivia started crying, he said to her, We're getting a divorce. Take the kid and get out of that condominium. The look he gave me, almost growling, truly sent shivers down my spine. Seeing my reaction, Patrick looked at Jacob with a cold gaze and said, You know that store is part of our company's chain, right? Considering the fuss you've made, you'll both be paying for the damages. As for you, stay home until you receive an official summons from the company. He then firmly kicked everyone out of the reception room. Afterward, Patrick began preparations to fire Jacob, consulting the company's legal advisor right after the milestone celebration incident. He was furious, saying, not only is Olivia's disgraceful behavior appalling, but Jacob's negligence in letting her run wild is just as bad. They even destroyed store fixtures and decor. Firing him is only natural, right? Though he was initially adamant about firing him immediately, the other executives calmed him down, explaining that a disciplinary dismissal made in anger could disadvantage us in a lawsuit. So we turned to a law firm known for its capable lawyers, true to their reputation, they did an excellent job providing indisputable evidence that was more than sufficient to fire Jacob. Two weeks later, Jacob, temporarily relieved from house arrest, was summoned to the head office meeting room, seemingly prepared for his dismissal. Perhaps he had gathered some inside information. Despite arriving with a lawyer, the sheer number of attendees overwhelmed him. As Patrick, sitting at the center of the board, began, it goes without saying why we've called you here today. Your dismissal has been decided. Jacob braced himself, clenching his fists. Mr. Jacob Miller, you are hereby dismissed. Patrick, acting as president, began reading the notice of dismissal to Jacob. His lawyer immediately objected. My client admits to the troubles with his stepmother Kelly, but insists that connecting this to his dismissal is wrongful termination. A voice rose. Glancing at Jacob beside him, he seemed quite pleased, nodding in agreement. There's no excuse for my ex-wife's rudeness at the recent milestone celebration, but that was a private matter. Isn't it wrong to fire me over it, he argued. Then, conspicuously placing a voice recorder on the desk, he said, I'm also prepared to report this as harassment to the media, if necessary, with a smug face. Hearing this, Patrick and the other executives remained silent. Jacob mistook their silence for victory. You're aware of the public backlash against companies that violate compliance, right? Are you sure you want to fire me knowing what will happen? He provoked further. At this point, Jacob's lawyer, not showing the expected signs of disturbance, but rather a hint of a smirk, seemed puzzled. Yet Jacob, ever so confident, failed to notice. Patrick then asked in a deeper voice than usual, Oh, so you wish to continue working with us? That's a hard pass. However, if you wish for me to leave the company amicably, a certain amount of money as a settlement would be necessary. Jacob said, leaning forward on the desk with a smirk as if to challenge the surrounding executives. But in the next moment, Laughter erupted spontaneously from everyone present. Some were even laughing so hard that tears formed at the corners of their eyes. Taken aback by their reaction, Jacob quickly turned red and began cursing foully. His lawyer frantically tried to calm him down. The dismissal notice naturally includes the reasons for dismissal. I'll explain them now, and if you have any objections, we can discuss them afterward, Patrick declared, 
his presence overpowering Jacob and his lawyer into silence. Both sat down. Then a group in dark suits stepped forward, bowed slightly, and turned on the electronic blackboard in the center of the meeting room. Immediately, the screen displayed screenshots of pages where wine exclusively imported for group participating restaurants was being sold on an online marketplace. Next, the screen showed an enlarged photo of the wine seller's icon. The moment it was displayed, Jacob stood up quickly, this isn't me. He exclaimed in desperation, turning pale, and for good reason. The photo used for the icon was a crop selfie of Jacob. The screen neatly displayed the original photos alongside an image match rate of 101% written in red. Facing the lawyer, still unable to grasp the situation, a man from the group of dark suits stepped forward, introducing himself as part of the law firm hired by the company. Let me explain the reasons for the dismissal notice. The reasons include embezzlement, harassment, undue pressure within the workplace using his executive position, leaking confidential company information, unauthorized absences, tardiness, loofing, and damaging the company's reputation through inappropriate use of a company car, he explained smoothly. He further added that the company's legal and accounting departments had been secretly investigating rumors of the wine, supposed to be sold exclusively in stores, being traded online. In the process, they identified the source account and, collaborating with the police and other relevant parties, discovered that the account was linked to Jacob's online banking account. Additionally, the inventory management department uncovered the existence of double books. Upon questioning, several employees confessed that they had been coerced into participating in the illegal activities by Jacob, who implied they would be fired if they did not comply. As this explanation unfolded, Jacob was sweating profusely, but his complexion turned even paler at the next images displayed. It was a video, seemingly taken secretly with a mobile phone, capturing Jacob as he subjected female interns and temporary staff to sexual harassment and unbearable words. Jacob's lawyer, standing by, couldn't take his eyes off the repeating video mouth agape. Next shown were images of customer information meant for our company being sold to a rival company and a USB drive containing original recipes alongside an envelope bearing the name of the rival company's legal counsel. Seeing this, Jacob's face turned from pale to ashen, and his hands trembled on the desk. Our lawyer continued without hesitation, explaining why the USB was transferred from the rival company. Actually, suspicions about the source of this confidential information had arisen even before it was utilized. Upon rechecking the acquisition method, it was found that an employee of the rival company had obtained it from Mr. Jacob Miller in exchange for a significant amount of cash, he explained. The rival company quickly dealt with the involved employee and returned the data to us, along with documents clarifying the factual situation. Jacob's lawyer, taken aback by the continuous revelation of Jacob's misdeeds, listened in stunned silence. However, our lawyer concluded with, while it might seem superfluous to mention now, all these illegal activities have already led to the filing of criminal complaints. Perhaps instead of discussing settlement money, you should be preparing for a criminal defense, he said with a chilling laugh. Jacob's lawyer turned red-faced. I've heard nothing of this from my client. I cannot represent him under these circumstances. I resign, he exclaimed, glaring at Jacob before storming out of the room. Left alone, Jacob's initial bravado disappeared, and he slumped in his chair. Before he knew it, the women he had harassed in the video lined up in front of him. We will be filing for damages as well, they firmly declared. Adding insult to injury, our lawyer continued, Moreover, it has been confirmed through social media posts that you've been unfaithful with multiple women using company resources, even during work hours, and engaged in inappropriate actions in public. The company will, of course, include these actions in its claims for damages. So please be prepared for that, he stated, 
speaking pleasantly but with no smile in his eyes. Jacob finally collapsed from his chair, sitting on the floor in defeat. As Patrick and the lawyer had declared, Jacob was swiftly dismissed for misconduct. In the investigation that followed Jacob, who was interrogated for embezzlement, tried to negotiate a settlement to avoid a prison sentence. However, finding a willing lawyer proved difficult, and he struggled to even pay the retainer fees. Eventually, he managed to cover the lawyer fees and compensation payments using the inheritance from his father, avoiding jail time for embezzlement. Yet, unable to prepare for the compensation claims for leaking confidential information, the emotional damages claimed by the women and the defamation lawsuits, Jacob found himself buried in debt. Olivia, understandably furious at being quickly discarded by Jacob for his own protection, filed for asset division, damages, and child support. In a defiant stance, Jacob demanded, then let's have a DNA test for the child, prioritizing the investigation of paternity over financial concerns. Confidently agreeing, Olivia was shocked when the results showed the child wasn't Jacob's biological offspring. Investigations by a detective hired by Jacob revealed Olivia had multiple partners at the time of their shotgun marriage, one of whom was the biological father, disproving any parental relationship between Jacob and the child. However, legally, Eric was still considered Jacob's child. Knowing he couldn't escape from the obligation of child support, Jacob initiated mediation to confirm the absence of a parental relationship. While a lengthy resolution was expected, the public exposure of Olivia's turbulent private life in court was something her parents wanted to avoid at all costs, leading to an explosive reaction. Stop bringing shame upon us. Enough with your antics, they demanded, forcing Olivia to withdraw all claims for asset division, damages, and child support. Then Olivia, for reasons known only to her, demanded of Zachary, you're the father of this child, so you should acknowledge paternity and pay child support. The biological father of her child, Zachary, who was married, refused to acknowledge his responsibility. Zachary was afraid his wife would find out, so he offered to pay some child support. But Olivia was not satisfied. She took the child and confronted Zachary at his home while he was away. Don't you think it's terrible that your child and mine, sharing the same father, aren't acknowledged and don't receive proper child support? She boldly stated, Zachary's wife, caught off guard by this revelation and already dissatisfied with her husband, promptly divorced him. She transferred all desirable assets, including a new house, savings, and stocks, into her name before kicking Zachary out with nothing. Initially, Olivia smirked at Zachary's divorce, thinking she could be the next wife. But upon learning he had lost all his assets and was ousted from his father-in-law's company, becoming unemployed, she quickly withdrew. Despite the cause being his own infidelity, Zachary felt his happiness had been destroyed and blamed Olivia. All of this is her fault, he said. Ever since then, he has been relentlessly pursuing Olivia wherever she hides. Terrified by his obsession, Olivia's parents, to avoid collateral damage, took in only their grandson Eric and disowned Olivia, kicking her out of their home. Left with nowhere to go and no one to turn to, Olivia resorted to night work to support Zachary, now a drunk and unemployed. As I was informed by a detective, I had hired for a follow-up investigation. Meanwhile, Jacob, after all the trials had concluded, was left with a mountain of debt and alimony payments. A claim for me for the restoration costs of the condominium seemed to be the final blow. Trying to make a comeback proved futile as he couldn't find stable employment and resorted to juggling short-term jobs, inevitably falling behind on repayments. There was a time when he possibly couldn't afford a mobile phone and called from a public phone, pleading, please, I need help, but the call ended in silence after I remained quiet. Rumors suggest he was last seen being taken to a worksite by barely legal debt collectors, but his whereabouts since then remain unknown. As for myself, taking this experience into account, 
I've become more actively involved in work. I used to think of myself as a decorative executive, a burden to my family, contributing nothing. However, during this ordeal, the company's female employees encouraged me. Even with accessible stores, its true usability can't be known without directly asking the users. Kelly, you could surely bridge that gap. Have more confidence in yourself. Getting more involved in on-site work made me realize I had become a pro at finding reasons for why I can't do this or that's impossible. Regretting not realizing this sooner, I'm now 51 with nine years left until retirement. Rather than mourning the irretrievable past, I'm determined to make the most of these next nine years. My current goal is to earn an extension of my retirement from Patrick and our relatives and to report this achievement to Jack, who has passed away. I can still feel the sting of his hands shoving me to the floor, the coldness in his eyes as he threw me out like garbage. This is what my 61st birthday has come to. My own son treating me like I'm nothing. Like I haven't spent my entire life loving him, raising him, sacrificing for him. And now, because of that wretched wife of his, he can't even stand the sight of me. Laura, even her name makes my blood boil. From the moment Henry brought her home, I knew she was trouble. The way she looked at me, like I was just an obstacle in her path. The way she whispered in Henry's ear, turning him against me little by little. I warned him not to marry her, begged him to see through her manipulations, but he was blinded by lust, by the idea that she loved him unconditionally. Ha! The only thing that woman loves is herself. And now, because of her, I've lost everything my son, my grandchildren, the family I've dedicated my life to. Cast aside like yesterday's trash. As I sit there wallowing, a car pulls up beside me. The window rolls down, revealing the concerned face of my best friend, Nicol. Megan, what happened? What are you doing out here? She asks, her voice laced with worry. I can barely choke out the words. Henry, he kicked me out, said I was crazy and that it was his house now. Nicol's eyes widen in shock, then narrow in anger. He did what? On your birthday? Oh, honey, get in the car. You're coming home with me. I climb into the passenger seat, my body numb as Nickel drives. She keeps glancing over at me, her brow furrowed. This is unacceptable, Megan. Henry can't treat you like this. Something has to be done. I shake my head sadly. What can I do, Mags? He's a grown man. He's made his choice. Nickel purses her lips, a determined glint in her eye. Maybe so, but that doesn't mean he gets to get away with it. You're his mother, for God's sake. It's time Henry and that wicked wife of his learned that there are consequences for their actions. I turn to her, confused. What are you saying? A slow smile spreads across Nicole's face. I'm saying, my dear, that it's time for a little revenge, and I know just the person to help us get it. As we speed into the night, I can't help but feel a spark of hope. I feel a flicker of something I haven't felt in a long time hope. Hope that maybe, just maybe, I can make Henry and Laura pay for the pain they've caused. Maybe karma will finally catch up to them. The day started off well enough, it was my birthday, and despite everything that had happened with Henry, I was determined to make the most of it. I spent the morning tidying up the house, putting up a few decorations, and preparing a special dinner. I even bought a cake from the bakery down the street, the one Henry always loved as a kid. Around noon, I called Henry, my heart fluttering with a mix of hope and nerves. To my surprise, he actually answered. Hey, Mom, what's up? His tone was neutral guarded. I took a deep breath. Well, I was wondering if you, Laura, and the kids would like to come over for dinner tonight. It's my birthday and I thought it would be nice to spend some time together as a family. There was a long pause. I could hear muffled voices in the background, like he was discussing it with someone. Finally, he spoke. Yeah, okay, we can do that. What time? Relief washed over me. How about 5 p.m.? I'm making your favorite lasagna. Sure, see you then, he said, hanging up before I could say anything else. 
The rest of the day passed in a blur of preparation and anticipation. By the time 5 p.m. rolled around, everything was perfect. The lasagna was bubbling in the oven, the table was set, and the cake was proudly displayed on the counter. Right on time, the doorbell rang. I practically ran to answer it, a huge smile on my face. But the moment I opened the door, my heart sank. Henry stood there with a scowl etched on his face. Beside him was Laura, her lips curled into a sneer. The kids were nowhere to be seen. Where are the children? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Laura let out a harsh laugh. We decided it was best they didn't come. Wouldn't want them exposed to any more of your toxic influence. I felt like I'd been slapped. Toxic influence? What are you talking about? She stepped forward, jabbing a finger at me. Don't play dumb, Megan. We all know what a terrible mother you were. The way you turned Henry against his own father, the constant guilt-tripping and manipulation. It's no wonder he wants nothing to do with you. Tears stung my eyes. I looked to Henry, silently pleading for him to defend me. But he just stood there, his arms crossed, saying nothing. That's not true, I managed to choke out. I've always loved and supported Henry. I would never do anything to hurt him. Laura's eyes flashed with anger. Spare us the martyr act. You're just a selfish, vindictive woman who can't stand that Henry has moved on with his life, that he chose me over you. Something inside me snapped. Before I knew what I was doing, I lunged forward, ready to slap that smug look off her face. But Henry stepped between us, grabbing my wrist in a painful grip. Don't you dare touch my wife, he growled. You're pathetic, you know that? Coming up with this whole birthday charade, trying to worm your way back in. Well, it's not going to work. We're done with you. With that, he shoved me backward, sending me stumbling. I caught myself on the doorframe, tears now flowing freely down my cheeks. Henry, please, I whispered. I'm your mother. But he just shook his head, his eyes cold. Not anymore. Come on, Laura, let's go. I watched helplessly as they turned and walked away, slamming the door behind them. The sound echoed through the empty house, a brutal finality to it. And there I stood, alone on my birthday, my heart shattered into a million pieces. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen in the aftermath of Henry and Laura's cruelty. Minutes, hours it all blurred together. The pain in my chest was unlike anything I'd ever felt before, a deep aching void that threatened to swallow me whole. Eventually, I managed to close the door, my hands shaking. I stumbled to the couch, collapsing onto the cushions as sobs racked my body. How could he do this to me? My own son treating me like I was nothing, like I hadn't spent my entire life loving and caring for him. The sound of my phone ringing jolted me out of my despair. I glanced at the screen, seeing Nichols' name. For a moment, I considered ignoring it, not wanting to burden her with my problems. But the thought of facing this alone was too much to bear. I answered, my voice thick with tears. Hello. Megan, what's wrong? Did something happen with Henry? The concern in her voice was my undoing. I broke down, the whole sordid story spilling out between gasps and sobs. Nickel listened patiently, offering words of comfort and support. That's it, she said firmly when I finished. This has gone too far. Henry and Laura can't keep treating you like this. It's time for them to face some consequences. I sniffled, wiping my eyes. What do you mean? I mean it's time for a little payback. They think they can just walk all over you, but they've got another thing coming. You're a strong woman, Megan. It's time to start acting like it. Her words ignited a spark within me, a flicker of anger amidst the pain. She was right. I couldn't just sit here and wallow. I needed to do something to take back control. Okay, I said, my voice steadier now. What do you have in mind? I could practically hear Nichols grin through the phone. Meet me at the diner in an hour. I've got someone I want you to meet. Trust me, he's going to be a big help. An hour later, I was sitting across from Nichol in a booth at the local diner. She had a mischievous glint in her eye as she sipped her coffee. 
So who is this mystery person? I asked, curiosity getting the better of me. As if on cue, the bell above the door jingled. Nickel waved at someone behind me. There he is now. I turned, my eyes widening as a tall, broad-shouldered man approached our table. He had a rugged, no-nonsense look about him, like someone who had seen his fair share of trouble. Megan, meet my brother Jack, Nickel said, gesturing for him to sit. He's a private investigator. Jack nodded at me, his gaze assessing. Nickel filled me in on your situation. I'm sorry to hear about what your son and his wife did. That's rough. I shrugged, trying to appear nonchalant even as the pain twisted in my gut. It is what it is, but Nickel seems to think you can help. He leaned forward, his elbows on the table. I can. In my line of work, I've learned that everyone has secrets, skeletons in their closet. And from what Nichols told me, I'm betting your daughter-in-law has more than a few. A tingle of anticipation ran down my spine. What are you saying? Jack smiled, slow and dangerous. I'm saying, let me dig into Laura's past. If there's dirt to be found, I'll find it. And once we have that ammunition, well, let's just say karma has a way of coming back around. I sat back, my mind reeling with the possibilities. Could this really work? Could I finally make Henry and Laura pay for what they'd done? Looking into Jack's confident eyes, I made my decision. I'm in, let's do this. He nodded satisfied. Excellent, give me a week. I'll be in touch, he said as he stood to leave. I felt a new sense of purpose and determination. They thought they could break me, but they were wrong. It was time for revenge. The week crawled by, each day feeling like an eternity of waiting and wondering. I tried to keep myself busy, throwing myself into cleaning the house, running errands, anything to distract myself from the constant churning of my thoughts. What would Jack find? Would it be enough to bring Henry and Laura down? Nickel checked in on me daily, offering words of encouragement and support. She was the only thing keeping me sane the only person who truly understood the depth of my pain and anger. Finally, on the seventh day, my phone rang. It was Jack. Megan, it's me. I've got something. Can you meet me at my office in an hour? My heart leaped into my throat. Of course, I'll be there. I arrived at Jack's office with 20 minutes to spare, my nerves jingling. Nickel was already there, pacing the small waiting area. She gave me a tight hug when I entered. Are you ready for this? She asked, searching my face. I nodded, stealing myself, as ready as I'll ever be. Jack emerged from his office, a grim expression on his face. Come on in, ladies. We settled into the chairs opposite his desk, the air thick with tension. Jack opened a manila folder, spreading out a series of documents and photographs. So I did some digging into Laura's background, he began, tapping the papers. And let me tell you, this woman is no saint. He slid a document toward me. First off, she has a criminal record embezzlement from her previous job. She managed to avoid jail time, but it wasn't pretty. I stared at the paper, a monk shot of Laura staring back at me. She looked younger, but those cold eyes were unmistakable. But that's not all. Jack continued, his voice grave. I also found out that she's a person of interest in the death of her ex-boyfriend. Nickel gasped. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. What do you mean? I managed to ask, my voice shaking. Jack handed me a newspaper clipping. Three years ago, her ex was found dead under mysterious circumstances. The police suspected foul play, but they could never prove anything. Laura was the last person to see him alive. I scanned the article, my eyes catching on phrases like suspicious death and ongoing investigation. My mind reeled, trying to reconcile this information with the woman my son had married. So what does this mean? Nickel asked, voicing the question in my mind. It means, Jack said, that we have the ammunition we need. We can use this information to confront Laura and Henry. They need to know that we're not backing down. Jack leaned back in his chair, his fingers steepled. It means we have leverage. 
If this information comes to light, Laura's life as she knows it would be over. Her reputation, her marriage, everything. A flicker of hope ignited in my chest. So what do we do now? A slow smile spread across Jack's face. Now we use it. We let Laura know that we have this information and that if she doesn't want it to go public, she needs to convince Henry to make things right with you. Nicole nodded, her eyes gleaming, and if she refuses, Jack shrugged. Then we go to the police. We let them reopen the investigation into her ex's death. One way or another, Laura will face the consequences of her actions. I sat there, stunned, trying to process it all. Could it really be this simple? Could I really make Laura pay for what she's done, for turning Henry against me? Looking at the determination on Nicole and Jack's faces, I felt a surge of strength. They believed in me, believed that I deserved justice, and for the first time since that awful birthday, I believed it too. Let's do it, I said my voice steady. Let's make them pay. Jack grinned, a predatory gleam in his eye. Excellent. Give me a day to put everything in motion. By this time tomorrow, Laura won't know what hit her. As we left the office, Nichols squeezed my hand. You're doing the right thing, Megan. Don't ever doubt that. I squeezed back, feeling a sense of purpose and righteous anger. They had picked the wrong woman to mess with. It was time for Laura to learn that lesson the hard way. True to his word, Jack called me the next day. It's done, he said, a note of satisfaction in his voice. I've sent all the information to Laura, along with a message letting her know that if she doesn't want it to go public, she needs to convince Henry to make amends with you. I felt a thrill of anticipation mixed with nervousness. Do you think it will work? Only one way to find out. But trust me, with the dirt we have on her, she'd be crazy not to comply. I hung up, my mind racing. Would Laura really cave? Would she really force Henry to apologize and make things, right? A part of me dared to hope, even as another part whispered that it was too good to be true. Hours passed with no word. I paced my living room, jumping at every sound, convinced it was the doorbell or the phone. But as evening fell, there was still nothing. I was about to give up and go to bed when there was a pounding at the door. My heart in my throat, I opened it to find Henry standing there, his face full of fury. What the hell did you do? He snarled, pushing past me into the house. I stumbled back, caught off guard. What are you talking about? He turned on me, his eyes blazing. Don't play dumb. Laura told me everything about the private investigator, about you digging up her past. What, you thought you could blackmail her into making me forgive you? I stood my ground, lifting my chin. I didn't blackmail anyone. I just let her know that her actions have consequences, that she can't destroy my life and get away with it. Henry let out a harsh laugh. Destroy your life? Are you serious? You're the one trying to destroy our marriage, our family first with your constant guilt-tripping and manipulation, and now this. Anger surged through me, hot and bright. I'm not the one who turned you against me, Henry. That was all Laura. She's poisoned you. Can't you see that? She's a criminal, a liar, maybe even a murderer. For a moment, Henry looked stunned, then his face hardened. You're unbelievable. You really think I'm going to believe your crazy accusations over my own wife? the mother of my children. They're not accusations, they're facts. Jack found proof. I don't care what your detective friend found, Henry roared. Laura is my wife, and I trust her. I love her, and nothing you say or do is going to change that. Tears stung my eyes, blurring my vision. So that's it then? You're choosing her over me, your own mother? Henry's jaw clenched. You made that choice for me the moment you decided to pull this stunt. I'm done with you, Mom. Done with your lies, your schemes, all of it. He turned to leave and panic seized me. I couldn't lose him, not like this. Henry, please, but he was already gone, slamming the door behind him with a finality that shook me to my core. I sank to the floor, sobs tearing from my throat. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. The truth was supposed to set me free, 
to bring Henry back to me. Instead, it had only driven him further away. Through my tears, I heard my phone ringing. It was Jack. I answered, my voice thick and shaky. Megan, what happened? Did it work? A bitter laugh escaped me. No, no, it didn't work. Henry, he's gone. He chose Laura. There was a pause, then Jack spoke, his tone determined. Then we move on to plan B. We go to the police and get them to reopen the investigation into Laura's ex's death. I shook my head even though Jack couldn't see me. What's the point? It won't change anything. Henry's made his choice. This isn't about Henry anymore, Jack said firmly. This is about justice, about making sure Laura pays for what she's done, one way or another. I closed my eyes, exhaustion and grief washing over me. Could I do it? Could I really destroy my son's wife, the mother of my grandchildren? But then I remembered the look in Henry's eyes, the venom in his voice, and the way Laura had smirked, so smug and self-satisfied. They had brought this on themselves, and now they would face the consequences. Okay, I whispered, a new resolve hardening in my chest. Let's do it. Let's make her pay. The next few days were a blur of activity. Jack and I gathered all the evidence he had collected, organizing it into a neat package to present to the police. Nickel was a constant presence, offering support and encouragement when my resolve wavered. Finally, the day arrived. We walked into the police station, heads held high, ready to blow the lid off Laura's sordid past. The detective listened intently as we laid out our case, his brow furrowing as he examined the documents and photographs. When we finished, he sat back with a grim expression on his face. This is serious stuff, he said, tapping the file. If what you're saying is true, we have grounds to reopen the investigation into Miss Wilson's ex-boyfriend's death. I felt a surge of vindication. It is true, every word of it. The detective nodded. All right then, leave this with me. I'll get the ball rolling. We left the station with a sense of anticipation thrumming through me. It was really happening. Laura was finally going to face the music. Three days later, I received a call from Jack. Turn on the news, he said, a note of triumph in his voice. I did as he said, my heart pounding as the anchor's face filled the screen. Breaking news, she announced, her expression grave. Local woman Laura Berlin has been arrested in connection with the previously unsolved death of her ex-boyfriend Brian Cox. New evidence has come to light, prompting police to reopen the investigation. I watched, transfixed, as they showed footage of Laura being led out of her and Henry's house in handcuffs, her face a mask of shock and anger. Henry followed behind, looking stunned and lost. A fierce satisfaction burned in my chest. She was finally getting what she deserved. But my joy was short-lived. The news report went on to describe how Henry had to use their savings to post Laura's bail and hire a lawyer. It was a financial blow, one that would undoubtedly put a strain on their marriage. I should have felt guilty knowing that I had played a part in their hardship, but all I could think was that it served them right. They had brought this on themselves with their cruelty and lies. Over the next few weeks, I watched from afar as the drama unfolded. Laura's arrest made headlines, and the public was ruthless. People speculated about her involvement in her ex's death and what other secrets she might be hiding. Henry put on a brave face, standing by his wife in public, but I could see the toll it was taking on him. He looked haggard, worn down by the constant scrutiny and whispers. Part of me wanted to reach out to offer comfort and support, but I hardened my heart. I reminded myself of how he had cast me aside, the vicious words he had hurled at me. He had made his bed, and now he would lie in it. One afternoon, as I was returning from the grocery store, I spotted a familiar figure on my doorstep. It was Henry, his shoulders slumped, his eyes red-rimmed. For a moment, I considered ignoring him, pretending I wasn't home but curiosity got the better of me. What do you want? I asked coldly as I approached, my arms laden with bags. Henry looked up, his expression a mix of exhaustion and desperation. 
Mom, I, I need your help. I raised an eyebrow. Oh, now you need my help? What happened to being done with me and my schemes? He flinched as if I'd struck him. I know, I know I said some awful things, but this, this is bigger than that. Laura's in real trouble, Mom. The evidence against her is bad. A flicker of unease passed through me. What are you saying? Henry's voice broke. I'm saying I don't know what to do. The lawyer fees alone are bankrupting us. And if Laura goes to prison, I can't raise the kids on my own. I need you, Mom, please. I stared at him, torn between the urge to comfort and the desire to lash out. He looked so broken, so defeated. But then I remembered the pain he had caused, the way he had abandoned me. I straightened my spine, my voice like ice. You should have thought of that before you turned your back on me. I'm sorry, Henry, but you're on your own. With that, I brushed past him, ignoring his pleas and apologies. He had made his choice, and now he would live with the consequences. A few days after Henry's desperate visit, I received an unexpected call. It was Laura's mother, her voice tight with barely contained anger. Megan, I know we've had our differences, but I need to ask a favor, she said, the words seeming to pain her. I felt a flicker of surprise. What kind of favor? It's the kids. With everything going on with Laura's case, Henry's struggling to keep up. He needs a break. I was hoping you could take the children for the weekend. I hesitated torn. On one hand, the thought of spending time with my grandchildren filled me with longing. It had been so long since I'd seen them. But on the other hand, the idea of doing anything to help Henry and Laura after everything they'd done galled me. Please, Megan, Laura's mother pressed, as if sensing my reluctance. I know you love those kids. They need some stability right now, and Lord knows they won't get it from Henry or Laura. I sighed, my resolve crumbling. She was right. Whatever issues I had with their parents, my grandchildren were innocent. They deserved better than to be caught in the middle of this mess. All right, I agreed. I'll take them for the weekend, but I'm doing this for them, not for Henry or Laura. Of course, thank you, Megan. I'll let Henry know to drop them off Friday evening. True to her word, Henry arrived on my doorstep that Friday with the kids in tow. He looked even worse than the last time I'd seen him, his face gaunt and shadowed. Mom, he greeted me, his voice hoarse. Thank you for doing this, I really appreciate it. I nodded stiffly, my attention on the children. They looked up at me, their eyes wide and uncertain. Grandma. My granddaughter cried, breaking into a smile. She rushed forward, wrapping her little arms around my waist. I hugged her back blinking back sudden tears. Hello, sweetheart, I've missed you. My grandson was more reserved, hovering by Henry's side. I knelt down, opening my arms. Come here, buddy, it's okay. Slowly, he stepped into my embrace, his small body trembling. My heart ached for him, for both of them. Henry cleared his throat. I'll pick them up Sunday evening. If anything comes up, just give me a call. I straightened, meeting his gaze coolly, we'll be fine, enjoy your weekend. With a final nod, he left, leaving me alone with the kids. I took a deep breath, forcing a smile. Who wants pizza for dinner? The weekend passed in a blur of laughter, games, and stories. For a little while, I was able to forget the drama and heartache, lost in the simple joy of being with my grandchildren. But all too soon, it was over. Henry arrived to collect the kids, his expression guarded as they gathered their things. My granddaughter tugged on my hand. Grandma, can we come stay with you again soon? We had so much fun. I smiled, smoothing her hair. Of course, honey, anytime you want. Henry's jaw tightened. We should get going. Say goodbye, kids. They hugged me tightly, their little faces sad. I watched as they climbed into Henry's car my heart heavy. As he prepared to leave, Henry paused and turned back to me. Listen, Mom, about what they said. I don't want you getting any ideas. This was a one-time thing. I bristled, anger sparking. Excuse me? You think I'm trying to turn them against you? Wouldn't be the first time, he muttered. I saw red. 
How dare you? I have done nothing but love and support those children, which is more than I can say for you and Laura. You're so wrapped up in your own drama, you can't even see how much they're hurting. Henry's face flushed. You have no idea what we're going through. No idea the stress, the pressure. And whose fault is that? I cut him off. You chose this, Henry. You chose Laura and all the chaos that comes with her. Don't you dare put that on me. He stared at me, his eyes hard. This isn't over, Mom. I won't let you poison my kids against me the way you did with Dad. With that, he got in the car and drove away, leaving me shaking with rage and hurt. I stood there, watching until the car disappeared from view, a cold determination settling over me. If Henry wanted to play hardball, then so be it. I was done playing nice. It was time to end this once and for all. The day of Laura's trial arrived, cold and gray. I dressed with care, choosing a somber black suit that radiated quiet authority. Nickel picked me up, her face set with grim determination. Are you ready for this? She asked as we drove to the courthouse. I nodded my jaw tight. I've been ready for a long time. We met Jack on the steps, his expression serious. I've got a surprise for you, he said, leading us inside. I tracked down Brian Cox's family. They're here to testify. I felt a surge of gratitude and vindication. With their testimony, Laura's fate would be sealed. The courtroom was packed, the air thick with tension. I took my seat behind the prosecutor's table, my heart pounding as Laura was led in, her wrists and ankles shackled. She looked pale and drawn, but her eyes still glittered with malice when they met mine. Henry sat stiffly beside her, his face a mask of conflicting emotions. I looked away, focusing on the judge as he called the court to order. The trial was grueling and emotional. The prosecutor laid out the evidence against Laura in detail, painting a picture of a cruel, calculating woman who would stop at nothing to get what she wanted. But it was the testimony of Brian Cox's family that truly sealed her fate. His mother, a frail silver-haired woman, spoke of her son's kind heart and bright future cut short. His sister wept as she recounted Laura's controlling and abusive behavior, how she had isolated Brian from his loved ones. Through it all, Laura sat stone-faced, her eyes cold and empty. Henry grew more and more agitated, his knee bouncing and his hands clenched into fists. Finally, it was time for the verdict. The jury filed back in, their faces somber. The foreman stood, clearing his throat. In the matter of the state versus Laura Berlin, on the charge of murder in the first degree, we find the defendant guilty. The courtroom erupted in gasps and murmurs. Laura's face drained of color, her mouth falling open in shock. Henry leaped to his feet, his chair clattering to the floor. No, he shouted, his voice raw with anguish. No, this is wrong, she's innocent. The judge banged his gavel, calling for order. Mr. Wilson, control yourself, or I will have you removed from this courtroom. Henry subsided, collapsing back into his seat, his head in his hands. Laura turned to him, her expression desperate. Henry, do something. You can't let them do this to me. But Henry wouldn't look at her, his shoulders shaking with silent sobs. The bailiff stepped forward, preparing to lead Laura away. I watched, a strange mix of emotions swirling within me. Triumph, yes, but also a hollow sort of sadness. It had come to this, my own son broken and humiliated, his life in ruins. As Laura was escorted out, she turned back, her eyes locking with mine. In that moment, I saw the depth of her hatred, the venom in her soul. This isn't over, she hissed, her voice low and deadly. I'll make you pay for this, I swear it. I met her gaze steadily, unflinching. You've already paid, Laura. You made your choices, and now you'll face the consequences. Goodbye. With that, I turned and walked out, my head held high. It was over. Justice had been served. But even as relief washed over me, a sense of sadness lingered. I couldn't shake the lingering unease. Henry's anguished face haunted me, the devastation in his eyes. Had I gone too far? 
had my quest for revenge blinded me to the collateral damage. I shook my head, pushing the doubts aside. No, Henry had made his bed, and now he would lie in it. He had chosen Laura, chosen to turn his back on me. Now, he would have to live with the fallout. I stepped out into the cold gray day, drawing my coat tighter around me. It was time to move on, to build a new life for myself. A life without Henry, without Laura's toxic influence. A life of my own making.